Good to see you this morning. Good to have everyone here. Thank you for coming and thank you for being a part of this morning's worship service. We in, invite everyone who is, enjoy, is joining us through the various forms of media to, to join us with your heart and your soul to let the Lord speak to you in a powerful way. It is, it is our hope. It is our joy each and every time that we are able to minister even beyond our own doors to those who may need to know Christ. Thank you all for coming, and thank you for being here, and, and thank you all who are joining up through, with us through the, as I said, through the various forms of media. May God bless you as we gather together this Sunday morning. We're going to get back into our worship service and song this morning. Our first hymn is hymn number 174. We're going to sing it a couple of times. His name is wonderful. Let's all stand as we sing. Ask you to remain standing for our affirmation of faith. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father Almighty, infinite in wisdom, power, and love whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. You may be seated. Our next hymn is uh, hymn number 462. 462. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. We'll sing all verses. Once again, 462.
At this time, if our ushers will come and receive this morning's regular offering, and that'll be followed by our building fund offering. <coughs> Our next hymn before we turn it over to Brother Steve for this morning's message is My Hope is Built. It's hymn number 368, and we're going to sing all verses. 368.
If you have your Bibles with you and would like to join with me in reading this morning, I'm going to be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 17, uh, beginning at verse 6. No, it's the entire, entire chapter, actually. John, chapter 17, uh, we'll read the entire chapter. John 17, the Gospel of John. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those who you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundations of the world, O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I know I have known you, and these have not known that these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it that they that the love which you love me may be in them and I in them. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his words. That sometimes is a difficult passage of scripture to read very well. I have two stories to tell you this morning. Both of them are true stories. Glenn Ludwig offers the first. In a mail advertisement, he writes, there is a book entitled The Black Book of, of Executive Politics. The book was advertised this way, according to Mr. Ludwig. The, this book is written by a world-class corporate infighter who prefers to remain anonymous. This priceless Volume contains 87 street smart hints, tips, shortcuts, ploys, strategies, and approaches for surviving and making it big in the company politics arena. People, all companies, politics are a game. But it is a game you have to play, like it or not, if you want to survive or to succeed in today's world. That's how the book was advertised. But then Ludwig goes on and says, listen to some of the, the contents. Style, not performance, is the key factor in determining who gets to make it into the break room, a boardroom. Teamwork is never the answer to corporate success. 
how to make points with the boss without obviously being on the make. How to learn inside information without being inside or unethical. The advertisement continues. It says, I know it all sounds like it's a bit paranoid, but there's, there's little time left, and, and paranoia will always protect your backside. You will get, in this book, the latest diabolical thinking on these political skills. Then it begins with a conclusion with this question. How many people in your company are sending for their copies of this black book right now? And it ends with this. Act now and receive a, a free copy of creating a loyal staff in your company. Ludwig finishes with this observation. To believe, to really believe that we are joined to Christ and to one another and can find wholeness and oneness in that union will always be in direct opposition to the preaching of the world that is around us. I'm curious, have, have any of you ever seen that kind of one-upsmanship that Ludwig talks about in the book? Have you ever seen power plays? Manipulation of people and facts is a means of, of shedding a little brighter light on, on the perpetrator. Doesn't have to happen in the boardroom, I can tell you that. I, I've seen it many times on the floor of the factory. I've seen it in corporate meeting rooms. I've seen it in teacher meetings as well. And to call it a game. I seriously doubt God would call it a game. But you see, here's the truth of it. People's lives are affected by that kind of gangsmanship. It's not good. It's wrong. And for a Christian, it is contrary to the will of God. How would you feel? How would you feel if you knew that there was someone following the rules of our world all at your expense? I've been there. I know exactly what that is like. And I'll I'm sure some of you have too. More importantly, how would you feel about the person or those persons who were doing that? Trust takes a long time to build. And only one single injustice can undo it. Can't be one if you don't feel that you can trust someone. You can't be one if the only thing that matters is you or them. Our world sings to a different tune than our God does. That is why Jesus asked for power from on high. We need a supernatural power to, and to enable us to be different than the world that we are living in. A power that works in us in such a way as to, as to feel that we are one with God and, and one with each other. It takes extraordinary strength to, to reach that goal. A power stronger than our ability to justify and rationalize why it is okay if we conduct ourselves like the world. After all, everyone else does it. Yeah, it, it takes a lot of work sometimes to not sound and look. And be like the world. Sometimes even in our own churches and Sunday schools we have a struggle. Of all the things Jesus prayed for and asked for. I would argue that this has to be the greatest challenge of all to God. This one has to be greater than, than raising Lazarus. Greater than changing water into wine. Greater than creating fish and bread to feed 5,000 people. And this has to be the greatest desire and the most difficult desire that Jesus ever prayed for. Why? Because this one means the hearts of men and women either must be changed from the way they think 
or strengthened in order for his prayer to succeed. And part of that change depends on mankind's willingness to hear and follow God's, God's way. Sometimes humankind, we ain't so good at that as we should be. So what do you think? I ask you. Could you trust the man or the woman who follows the black book of executive politics? The one who plays the game? Chances are, if you do, you will never be the one because whoever's in that game has to be the one. There's another story. This one comes from Harold Kushner. Kushner tells of an incident from his youth that made an extraordinary impression on him. A business associate of his father died under particularly tragic circumstances. Kushner decided to, to go with his father to the gentleman's funeral. Now, the man's widow and children were surrounded by clergy and psychologists trying to, to ease their grief, to make them feel just a little bit better. Well, they knew all the right words and, and the best approaches, but nothing helped. They were beyond comfort, it seemed. The, the tragedy was too raw and, and too intense for them to find any comfort. The widow kept crying and saying, you're right about everything you're saying. I, I know that you're right, but don't you see, it just doesn't make any difference to me right now. Then the man walked in. This man, this great big man, a big burly man, a man in his, in his 80s who was a, who had become a legend in the toy and game industry. He had escaped from Russia as a youth after having been arrested and tortured by the Tsar's secret service. He came into this country Ill illiterate and penniless, and, and he built a, a successful company. He had worked very hard to succeed, but despite his success, he, he never learned to, to read or write. He actually hired people to read his mail to him, for him. The joke in the industry was, he could write you a check for a million dollars. The hardest part of it would be for him to be able to sign his name to it. He had been sick recently, and his face and his walk showed it, writes Kushner. Now he walked up to the widow, and he bent over toward the widow, and he started to cry. He embraced her, and she and her children cried with him. Kushner said immediately the entire atmosphere in the room was completely changed. This man who had never read a book in his life, but he spoke. He spoke the, the language of the heart. He held the keys, the gates to, to that family's souls. Where learned doctors and clergy could not go, a man with a good heart could. I would say that story represents a sacred moment of oneness, wouldn't you? A time when the power of care and compassion was stronger and more powerful than, than intellect or, or knowledge or, or skill. A moment when a man's heart spoke volumes more than his lips could have ever offered. Which one of these two stories do you think represents a life or an act in harmony with God? It is not difficult to choose, is it? Well, it is not difficult to choose the better story. But I tell you this, sometimes it is difficult to choose the better way, even our, for ourselves. There is so much around us today tempting us to believe that, that what matters most is what we can get out of it ourselves, what we can take from it our, ourselves. Little in our lives or little in our living in this world calls us to love others as we have been loved by Christ. 
Indeed, the, the very topic is enough at times to make even some of the churches wish we could just find something else to talk about, please. But the scriptures are clear, aren't they? We are not alone. Nor are we to perceive ourselves as being alone in this world. We are one with God, one with Christ, and one with each other. It's an odd math, but it's God's math. And that's all that matters. So we should, we should pray for that great and, and mighty spirit of God to come among us, to live and exist among us and in us. And more importantly, we should pray that it should have victory over us. We need that power so we do not look like or sound like or act like the world we are living in. We are the church. We are called to be different than the world that is around us. Jesus was sent to the world by God. He came here to reveal a new way. A new way whose central message was a call. Was a call to love God and neighbor. How many times does Jesus have to be asked? What are the greatest commandments? Love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and your strength. And who? Your neighbor is yourself. In doing so, you fulfill all the laws of the prophets. Jesus was just hours away from the cross when he prayed that prayer. And he knew that, that in time, if he was going to be recognized as the Son of God, that message had to succeed in the world. And it had to be alive and well in the body of Christ. The church is that body charged with that task. So here... We must always do all that we can to be bound together with care and compassion and joy and fellowship for every single person who's a part of this church life. We are to be united in common cause, energized and mobilized by our love for God and our love for Christ and most importantly our love for one another. Then through us, maybe someone will believe in Jesus. Believe in the power of God's spirit as it's been made evident in us. And if we do it right, if we do it right, then, then maybe someday someone will write a, a new book. And they'll call it The Success and the Power of Oneness with Christ. That'd be a good book. Of course, on second thought, we already have that book, don't we? Our closing hymn. Thank you. Our closing hymn is 467. We're going to sing the first and fourth verse of Trust and Obey. Let's all stand.